Well, good evening, everybody, and um, welcome uh, to the latest event in uh, this uh, great Royal Television Society strand, which is Anatomy of a Hit. There have been some huge programmes discussed in this way uh, since Broadchurch was the first in 2013. There's been Sherlock, Doctor Who, Poldark, the Night Manager, The Crown, and you've got some coming up as well. You've got Line of Duty and Love Island uh, soon. Now, tonight's series is undoubtedly a hit under any circumstances that you care to uh, name. 16 years after the original Blue Planet was shown on the BBC, the seven-part series, narrated by Sir David Attenborough, has been sold to more than 30 countries. It attracted more viewers in the UK than any other programme last year. The first episode was seen by 14.1 million people in the first week it was broadcast. It was not only the most watched programme last year, it was the third most watched programme of the past five years behind only the Football World Cup final in 2014 and the 2016 Great British Bake Off final. So yeah, uh, what true. does this say about, uh, about our viewing habits? Um, among many awards so far, with hopefully more to come, uh, it was also voted the best programme of the year in a poll of TV critics by Radio Times, and that says something, I think. The critics actually fell over themselves to praise it. It's impossible not to be mesmerised by the footage on display. You just have to watch it unfold and be a little grateful that the BBC spent four years in production on this, 125 expeditions, 39 countries, 6,000 hours diving on every continent and every ocean. Stunning technical mastery, it goes on and on. We saw surfing dolphins in the first episode, we saw the walnut walrus herd struggling to find blocks of ice on which to uh, uh, rest. We later saw fish leaping to catch birds, we saw an octopus strangling a shark and uh, disguising itself uh, with, uh, uh, with shells, uh, and we saw another bird, uh, another fish tapping uh, a shell to try and break it open. Absolutely amazing uh, things. One critic said, Blue Planet 2 is filled with these kinds of moments. And to have the cameras there in the perfect place at the perfect time to catch such a scene from multiple angles, it's easy to take for granted. So tonight we're gonna find out how that was all done, what you need to do if you yourself out there would like to make a seven part series um, uh, going to every uh, continent known to man and under the sea. This will be how it is done. So, um, what's gonna happen is that I'm gonna talk to each of them in turn uh, about who they are, where they've come from. They have chosen a clip each, and we're gonna talk about that <coughs> clip. Uh, it's not a clip you've seen, um, uh, it's not one of the, the fish haven't given the rights back, therefore we can't actually show clips from the series. What we're doing is looking at the clips about how, how it was made. And then we're gonna broaden it out and we're gonna have questions from you uh, and so on. But we have this fantastic panel and um, opposite me is James Honeybourne, who was the executive producer. It was his idea, he made it happen. He graduated as a biologist. He's worked at the BBC's Natural History Unit ever since. He learned to scuba dive some 20 years ago when producing David Attenborough's Wildlife on One and he's done lots of other things s s as well. As executive producer, he's overseen some 35 films working with multiple co-producers uh, around the world. Recent projects include the Emmy-nominated series Wild New Zealand with National Geographic, the BAFTA-winning BBC One series Big Blue Live with PBS, and he conceived Blue Planet 2 in 2013. Sarah Connor is an assistant producer, one of four assistant producers. She initially pursued a career in science, um, but wildlife diving and the outdoors was always her passion, uh, and that's how she spent all her free time. Her experience scuba diving and her knowledge of the ocean led to her accidentally becoming a contributor to Blue Peter, and since then she's had an exciting career specialising in natural history, science and adventure programme making for the BBC Science Pro Department on series such as Horizon, Earth's Natural Wonders and Operation Iceberg, and most recently in the Natural History Unit. Finally, Mark Brownlow next to me is another highly acclaimed wildlife filmmaker. He was a series producer. He's got over 20 years experience producing and directing underwater documentaries for the BBC Natural History Unit. His producer credits include the Emmy award-winning BBC and Discovery Planet Earth and Wild Pacific. He series produced BBC's Emmy-nominated Ocean Giants, the three-parter on whales and dolphins, and Hidden Kingdoms. Uh, so again, these are the people who made it happen because they are so experienced and they know how to do it. So first of all, I'm going to ask each of you in turn a bit about yourself. So James, 
just a bright idea, or was somebody saying to you, you've got to come up with the next big one? Um, back in 2013, January 2013, we um, broadcast a series called Africa with David Attenborough that I had series produced. And um, we were slightly nervous because Africa's kind of a very well-trodden route for wildlife filmmakers. Would people feel that this was fresh and easy. So we'd really gone out on news stories and um, it has created um, a, an impact uh, as a series when it went out. And it, it kind of really helped me come to the conclusion that if we were going to keep making these big landmark series, then the, everyone has to be a new story and newness would have to drive everything um, that we did. And uh, I was aware that it had been uh, then, um, about 12 years since the original Blue Planet had come out, and, and that there were so many new stories to be told underwater, and that's because of the new technologies, the new advances, advancements in technology, and also the incredible new science that had been going on, a lot of science had been going on in the oceans. And um, looking forward, we could see that if this was going to come out in 2017, that would be... Um, 16 years later than the original series, or 20 years since they set out to make that series. And that's a generational time difference. And with so much new science and new technology, it felt like there would be new stories to tell. But uh, we very quickly realized our big challenge would be um, that actually that world is very different from the land-based world we know. You know, it's a, it's a world of cold and slimy fish and it's dark and it's alien and it's sometimes terrifying um, and how would we connect people how would people uh, be able to sit at home on a Sunday evening and feel a connection to this world um, and so that we realized would be our biggest challenge you know to, to, to drive some form of emotional connection through the, the the stories we would choose the characters we would meet and portray um, and again technology we knew could come to the, the fore on that so for example um, there's a thing called a rebreather so instead of scuba diving you uh, recycle your air and that means you don't make bubbles and if you don't make bubbles you don't have the sudden visual disturbance poof, of these bubbles going up and also they don't make sound and the fish are just much more relaxed with you like that and i'd noticed uh, as a rebreather diver during africa that um, the fish would just let you into their world a bit more and so it was it was knowing things like that that sort of gave us a clue that probably we could bring out the characterization of these animals more so it was the ambition of new stories through new science and new technology combined with that uh, our desire to really help people feel connected to this world so that ultimately we'd care about it that was our challenge um, and was somebody already working on planet earth too because again you're producing as a unit a huge amount of, of stuff. So that was already in production when you said, right, well, we'll do the sea if they're doing the earth. Is yes, that how right. it works? Yeah, no, we yeah. were very aware that they were doing the land and there yeah. was an opportunity here. Um, and there are enough really qualified people like you to cover the ground for, for, for both. Well, once you've got that ambition and you kind of know your goal, then it's all about pulling the team together. And for okay. me, yeah. the first thing to do was to have a chat with Mark because <laughs> I knew... If anyone could put Bruce it off, Lee. Mark yeah. could. So, yeah. Yeah. And, then, and then together we pulled together a team. So where do you then start? You've got the whole world. Um, uh, wh how do you start planning something like that? Well, we, had, we wanted to... We, we split the uh, series into programmes, and we did that around... Um, we wanted each episode to feel very different. Um, you wouldn't want to feel like you were coming back to the same episode each time. And different habitats allow you to do that. So one on green seas, one on the big blue. Um, you know, it, it starts to carve itself up. And, and one on coral reefs, that felt very natural. One on the deep. Um, and so you begin to feel that how every episode can be different. And then really, it's about um, forming the connections with the scientific community. Because ultimately, that's where these new stories are going to come from. And our, you know... That relationship with uh, oceanographic institutions, with individual scientists, uh, and also with with um, dive communities around the world who are out there actually seeing stuff, uh, that was going to be the source of, of our new stories. And and at the time, you kind of promise it. You say, oh, yes, we're going to tell great new stories. But you don't know what they are. People say, like, what? Well, I don't know. We haven't done the research yet. Because the truth is, a lot of those stories come to you in the second and third years of the production when you've really won people's trust and confidence. And someone then comes to you and says, hey, I've just seen something a few times, and it's, I think you should come and have a look. You know, And that's where we, that's where we start to... 
um, you know, really, really breaks through. And that's how we heard about, for example, the giant trevally, the large fish that leaps out of the water and catches a bird <coughs> in midair. That was because of uh, literally a fisherman's tale that came to us out of South Africa. And this one guy said, hey, I think I've seen this. And we looked into it, and there was no record of it and no photos of it, but there was just enough for us to feel this could be worth a shot. And, uh, you know, you have a very finite budget. You've got a finite time. You've got a very tight deadline to deliver the series. But, but ultimately, we have to, you know, gamble on, on nature. And, you know, she never reads the scripts, but sometimes we get lucky. And your role is to oversee all of this, and then you're um, deploying people to do uh, bits of it. And obviously, Sarah is an uh, assistant producer. What is your role? How, what, what do you do in all of this? I think I have probably the most um, fun and satisfying part in that I get to go and direct on location. I get to be on the boats, working with the scientists, diving with the cameraman and seeing everything, um, all the behavior firsthand, and then going through all the rushes on the boat, making sure we're getting enough of the footage that I can come back to Mark and um, know that we can make a, a whole story, a whole sequence out of it. Can everyone hear that? Is that mic OK? Yes, all right, lovely. Um, and who decides which bits you're going to do? Or do you say, actually, I really want to do this bit? How is that all done? I'll come to Mark, so he will no doubt say some of that. But, yeah. Um, in part, I think it depends on the, like, the, the, for example, the diving skill level of people. People came to our production with different, uh, a different set of abilities. I've done a lot of um, technical rebreather diving, deep diving, in overhead environments and things like that. So I had a certain skill set that was useful. Other people had done maybe more um, free diving or open circuit diving where, as James was saying, makes all the bubbles and things like that. So we, we came with different skills to be able to do different types of shoots. Um, but also it then comes down to how busy we are um, with the different programs. So I was able to direct across almost the whole series um, different shoots uh, to help out the different teams depending on uh, if people were on other shoots at that time, then I could go and do... And do what does help. directing involve? I mean, you don't say to the fish, can you just do that again, please? I mean, how, do, how, does, it, how does it work? You can try, it doesn't work. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it, it really... It, it depends on the type of shoot, but it's, it, it's a lot of team management, management of the, the safety of the diving as well. Um, and then often I would be in the water with the cameraman, um, so I can be a safety diver, but we can also be on um, communication devices, full face masks, so we can actually talk about the shots that we're wanting to get at that time, if, if it's something where we can plan a little bit. For example, with some of the more technical filming equipment, you plan shots, like moving through the kelp and that sort of thing. Um, if it's whales that are just passing past, then you know, we decide if we're going to go in with a lens that's going to get close-ups or if we're going to be going in with a lens to get wide shots. And that will be based on what footage we've already got that I've reviewed the night before. Um, so it, it's sort of, you're, you're directing, I guess, working, directing the cameraman rather than the, the fish. And what have you done before that qualified you to do this? Because so, you've worked on lots of series and, and, and so on. Sure, yeah. I mean, I've I directed a lot of the... Um, natural history and underwater segments from the BBC's science department, like um, on Earth's Natural Wonders, which I'd worked on just before Blue Planet. Um, I'd filmed out in Indonesia with manta rays and whale sharks and things like that. Um, and then all my time working through um, with independent TV companies as well as within the BBC, I'd say been with producers and they'd given me sections I could direct and just gradually that got more and more till um, I was yeah, directing my own stories. And do you apply for this sort of job or does Mark come and say, I want you? Or? I think it depends on the series. Um, because James actually approached me for the development stage of this, but I was already working on something else. Um, uh, for this, uh, for the actual series, I ended up having to um, apply. Actually, while I was in Indonesia, I didn't have very good internet, so I sent it almost in single lines and very basic emails um, to, to get it through. Um, and then, yeah, I came and I had um, an interview with Mark and James, and then, yeah, they got back to me, so I had the job, which is quite exciting. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. so, I mean, yeah. it literally is a dream job, because I was, I, since I was three, I wanted to be a scientist. Um, and then I was a contributor on Blue Peter, and I realized 
TV is actually how I can share my passion and sort of experiences of all the diving and climbing and things like that I've done, so which is why I ended up joining TV. But all my, my first break in TV, my first promotion and getting to work on this series actually didn't come from my science background purely. It came from all the, the diving and things like that that I was doing. So. So, Mark, what was your role? I mean, James said, I need Mark, uh, and you're the series producer, so what do you do? Uh, so, we have a core team of 25 people dedicated to the project over four years, and James has sort of the ground view, and then I come in and do the detail and, and help uh, drive, drive the project. Um, if you kind of break down... The, the, the kind of tree of, of jobs. You've, you've got a, five producers, and each producer is assigned to one or two episodes. They'll then have talented people like uh, Sarah on board um, who will be assigned to, to one or two of those episodes. And then there are researchers who are typically marine biologists who are scouring the world for, to talking to scientists and other experts to try and find those extraordinary new stories. And that process of just finding those stories can take up to a year. And the constant feedback and refinement of storylines and, and, and narrative arcs, uh, um, I'll be brainstorming with the producers and their teams and then pitching them to James. And then when it gets into the filming efforts, which can take over, which kind of consumes around two and a half years of, of the timeline, uh, it's constant... Um, reviews of storyboards um, so that we can be as, as focused as possible. Once we've committed to a new story, we've got the right equipment and we've got the right ambition to try and film it. Now, that can sound a bit kind of... Uh, uh, um, a bit overambitious when, you, when you're thinking of filming a bait ball, but actually, uh, a bait ball, like the one we've seen a bit, uh, required helicopter aerials, it required specialist uh, tracking pole cameras, it uh, had tow cameras so that we could do a sort of fast and furious interpretation of how these fleeting opportunities have to be exploited by these super fast predators. So by storyboarding all the equipment, and we invested a huge amount of time, effort, money into building these groundbreaking new bits of a, a camera equipment to give a fresh visualization of, of the underwater world. You then, so you storyboard it, and then the teams are going out. Sarah, fortunately, has got WhatsApp, so every night she can send rushes and, you, and give feedback with her producers and myself. And it's a constant sort of refinement as you're on location. Uh, do we stay longer? Do we pull the plug? Is it going well? What can we do to improve it? Do we go back next year? That takes sort of two and a half years of your life, and then there's a whole year of putting these these films together to, to make seven hours of television. And uh, we're, we're looking at 15 week edits per episode. And uh, James comes in towards the end and goes, you've got to be kidding me, what's this? <laughs> and uh, it's, it's again uh, trying to always raise the bar, and make sure that the stories are compelling and, and engage, engaging. Mm. And that's just the editing. You then got the whole kind of uh, um, really kind of polishing the, the images, and then we've got the huge sound effort, which is everything from writing the scripts, working with David to, to, to um, make sure the words marry up with the images as seamlessly as, as complementary as possible, working with uh, our composer Hans Zimmer and his team in LA to, to make sure that the music is, is, is evocative and tells the story. And the, the, the secret in natural history filmmaking is you actually want to have a minimal commentary and let the, the visuals and the music tell the story and set, set the emotional tone. And then just a little bit of guidance uh, and poetry for, for, from Sir David. And so just packaging all that can, can take a year of your life. In fact, that's the really stressful bit, mm. uh, as well as the filming. That's pretty stressful too. Mm. But we have... <laughs> We, we have experts like Sarah, and, and, and you've got to remember what Sarah, she's, she's probably the most humble person I know. I mean, she's really hardcore, really hardcore diver. But also combine that with a unique television knowledge, and those two marry up to, to create this rare skill set that, that means that you can execute these films safely on location and see through the, the, the narrative that you're after. And he really keeps out of your hair until that last minute. Uh, no, James, uh, well, I think we'd have monthly conversations. And um, the thing is, the truth is that you get close to, to your subject, and what you need is someone who has a bit of distance and says, 
actually, I love that, but why, don't you, why don't, have you thought about doing it like this? And it's just having that, 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 uh, that other viewpoint that can be fresh and has, and has a long... Yeah. Well, no, I was just going to say, we did like 125 expeditions, and each one of those you have to kind of sign off with a script and a storyboard and a mm. health and safety plan. You know, that's a major Absolutely. part of it that yeah. people forget, actually, is just the, <laughs> yeah. you know, the health and safety of going to these really remote places and how, how are you going to get people out if there's an issue. And, by the way, you're, you know, you're doing... You're down deep with sharks or whatever it is. You know, it's not... You know, it, you can't take it lightly, and that, managing that is a yeah. big part for all of us, isn't it? I mean, what one shoot, which was when James was on, uh, um, we were the first people in history to to dive a man submersible to depth in Antarctica. That took a year and a half to to organise, and and that ended up being the five minute intro to the deep episode, along with some of our environmental episode at the end. But really, that generated less than ten minutes of, of content. I think we've got seven hours to generate. So that all that effort just, and that's that's the sort of the finessing and the quality that, that we have to instill. And make, so we put this huge effort in, into the logistics. And how close does the storyboard get to the finished product? Uh, sometimes th there is no th no connection at all. <laughs> Other times it's spot on. It's quite remarkable, how, uh, uncanny. But that's that's a testament to the preparation, the sign off. We don't just. It's all about educated risk and long conversations with scientists, experts, field researchers, and really drilling down to the detail and, and seeing what we think is possible. Sometimes a recce, but, but, but generally not really. Yeah. Uh, and um, it just takes that. So, so because the real money is when you leave the door and go out on location, you, you, you don't do that likely. You make sure that you've so as prepared as possible mm -hmm in every way, so that you maximize your chances of success. Can I just say as well that, uh, you know, we did have 25 people in the office, but probably around the world there were a thousand people we worked with on, on this in terms of sort of logistics and support and the local scientists and conservationists. Um, and so you've got this big global community of people that you build up as the project goes on. Um, that become, you know, incredible support and they give you the amazing insights and often show you ways of doing things. And, and also from a health and safety point of view, you know, it would be a bit arrogant to rock up somewhere and think that you just know all about the local conditions. You know, you really need people who have lived and dived there all the time. And, and so we're, you know, we feel like we're part of a team that's much bigger than our own office, you know. Okay. Right, let's see some clips. So James, you've chosen a clip. Which one and uh, what does it tell us? I, well, um, so I was lucky enough to, work, uh, to go on a few of the uh, submersible expeditions. And um, to me, the deep ocean is still the most uh, you know, unexplored part of our planet. Uh, we have uh, scanned with ships 20% of the seabed. The rest of that stuff, the, the maps you see of the oceans, that's all done from satellites measuring tiny variations in sea level rise. So we haven't seen it. And, uh, and the 20% scanned by ships is one thing, but that's still not telling us much. Um, the amount of seabed that humans have actually glimpsed with their own eyes is about a thousandth of 1%, we think. Um, so there's so much out there we still don't know. You know, and, and that makes it incredibly exciting. And that also means it's likely that's where we'll find new stories to tell. So um, it's, it's a very exciting place to operate in. It's, um, weirdly, governments used to have lots of manned submersibles. Now they don't. They tend to use uh, robotic vehicles. Um, so you have to try and find people who have submarines. And where possible, you dive two submarines together because uh, that allows one to act as a lighting vehicle and get behind the subject, give you three-quarter lighting, make it start to look beautiful. Because, again, going back to that idea of connecting people to this world by making it beautiful really helps. So often, the scientific vehicles, they kind of headlight stuff, and it's, it's, a very, it's good for science. It's not so great for, for a beautiful image. So to have a second submersible lighting is... Um, a, um, an artistic uh, necessity, not just a luxury. It's, it's absolutely, you, you know, you can turn um, deep sea exploration into a beautiful and artistic uh, 
uh, thing as well. Um, so that felt important. Um, and wherever possible, we did dive two submarines. I went uh, into the Gulf of Mexico, where we had those brine pools, those lakes of salt at the bottom of the ocean. Uh, that was an extraordinary place to be. It was a very geologically sort of um, active area in terms of sort of oil deposits and methane gas coming out. We were only about 10 kilometers from the deep water horizon spill. And uh, we did find oil at depth, you know, just sort of on the seabed and things. It might have dispersed at the surface, but it's down there. Um, we also, as Mark said, we took the submarines to Antarctica. Um, and no one had taken a submarine deep in Antarctica before. And we got down to 1,000 meters. So that's 100 times atmospheric pressure down there. Um, and scientists were divided about what we'd see, and some scientists had told us that really we shouldn't expect much life below 500 meters. Um, but there was a world down there that was not only rich in terms of sort of biomass, numbers of species, but it was incredibly colorful as well. It was a real beautiful new world. And whilst we were down there one day, um, a rock flew past the window of the submarine from a melting iceberg above. And, and that reminded us, A, of the danger, well, a danger we hadn't actually thought of in our hazard form. Um, <laughs> yeah. but, I, but also, um, it made us suddenly realize that all these bumps on the seabed were other boulders. And, and that's where life was gathering. And these boulders that were being dropped by the icebergs were forming um, firm anchor points for all sorts of marine organisms. So we, we got an insight into how the whole ecosystem works that you never would do if you were just diving ROVs. So I, I do believe that manned submersible exploration is really important. Um, but the, bit, the clip I wanted to share um, was done, all filmed just within one sub. And uh, we collaborated with a team of scientists from the University of Zors and also um, some owners of a private submarine based there. Um, and uh, very sadly... One of the things that's happening with increasing frequency in the oceans is a, a phenomenon known as ship strikes. And that's where ships hit whales, run them down. And um, whales aren't evolved to, 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 to get out of the way of vessels. They don't really understand that. Um, in fact, a blue whale's self-defense mechanism is to go down about five meters and hover, which is really not good news. So uh, ship strikes is a, is a challenge and an issue. And, and we came across a sperm whale that... Um, had died, and the University of, Zor of Azores tagged it so that when it sank, we'd be able to find it at depth. And uh, we, were, we went down there the, you know, within 24 hours. And, and what we saw um, was really quite impactful on the, on the team. Uh, and it kind of reminds you that there really are sea monsters down there. So let's have a look at, uh, let's have a look at this clip. Let's see the clip. found the whale carcass and enormous six gill sharks. We estimate them about six meters long. Over. Okay, pop Wow. 
<laughs> How did that feel? How did that feel for people in, I mean... Well, uh, fortunately, we didn't hear about it till afterwards when they were up safely. <laughs> um, I, I think, uh, you know, it's funny because they calmed down as quickly as they'd got agitated. And I think these sharks, literally, they're just, they're big bruisers. And uh, before then, they'd only ever been documented as individuals on whales. And here was a group of them. And they were just argy-bargy was how they sort of did their thing. Um, so... You know, a, an amazing experience for the team and you know, a, a great sequence for us. We were very lucky. Yeah. So, Sarah, your uh, clip is called Bobbit. Tell us what uh, that yeah. is. Isn't so, it? this is um, the clip a version that was shown on TV of the Bobbit worm, which is um, a worm that eats fish. But this actually relates back to your question on how close to the storyboards that we, we come when we come back with the footage. So in the team's defense, when they don't come back matching the storyboards, we actually did have El Nino um, affecting the oceans for about two years of our filming. And that changes the animal's um, behavior and location and things like that. Um, and on this shoot, that was an issue. But instead of warming the seas, we were in Indonesia and it cooled them. Um, so I don't know if we, do you want to, maybe we could watch it first and watch then I could and then talk, talk about, about it. it. Yes, let's yeah. see the clip, thanks. Yeah. Nocturnal predators, such as this lionfish, patrol the reef edge. Carnivorous worm with jaws as sharp as daggers. It has an ancestry that stretches back more than 400 million years. It's a metre long. never been filmed um, in the wild for television before but we actually decided to film this not just to capture the worm hunting but because a scientist had come to us who'd managed to film some fish that actually had um, a behavior in the daytime where they'd come and blow on the bobbit worms lair uh, to try and mark out where it is possibly to scare it off or to um, be able to avoid it at night so they hopefully wouldn't end up as, as food and this paper hadn't been published, um, it only actually got published, I think it was a, a year or two after we'd filmed. Um, so this was like really, really new science that we were you know, going to go and film. We'd seen some uh, photos of the bobbit worm before, so we found the best location to be able to film them where they're most active and where there are the most of them so that we can find a good one to work with. So we went out there um, and El Nino for Indonesia had actually made the water a lot colder than it should have been for that time of year. So for us, that meant um, we came out of our dives, which were about eight hours every night, quite, quite chilly. Um, mm. and, uh, but it also meant the fish weren't as active and the bobbit wasn't quite as active. And it also didn't seem to like our white lights that we, we needed to be able to film at dark, because otherwise we can't see. It sort of became shy, and that we, that we think, talking to the scientists, it's got receptors that are possibly sort of light sensitive, so it felt it was daytime because it only hunts at night, mainly. Um, as the poor, poor Scolopsis blowing fish found out, it does sometimes hunt in the day. Um, so we went there, we set up our, uh, it's like an underwater tripod, 
you know, by where the Scolopsis lair is, which you can find because there are little bones of fish just next to it. Um, so we get there, we set up just as the sun's coming down, we kneel there, we put our lights up and we wait. And he sort of comes out and then just goes back down. Eight hours later, he's done nothing. You know, we go and look for some others. Same thing across a number of nights. And then it's like, hmm, there's a problem. Um, we put a red filter over our lights, which is something we can sometimes do uh, just to make it less harsh for the fish underwater. And he came out and stayed out a little bit longer. Um, now, the cameraman who was filming this, Hugh Miller, is he's a, a very talented cameraman, but he also uh, helped on our series develop a lot of our uh, specialized new equipment to film this. And he had just finished making an underwater light uh, that could um, deliver infrared. Um, normally, this doesn't travel very far underwater, but he'd sort of managed to develop it so it could actually travel quite a, a reasonable distance, which means we would be able to light up a, a wider area than normal. So we thought, we, we really have nothing to lose. So we put it up um, one evening, and the bobbit just started coming out and you know, was ready to hunt. We had, like I say, because of the colder water, the fish were slightly less active, so we weren't getting as many as like, the dive centre had thought we would, that we were working with. But you know, we still, as you can tell, started actually getting, getting yeah, hunting sequences. First of all, we'd seen a few small fish get taken. I mean, because it looks quite a big one, but really it's, it's, its head is maybe that size at, at its biggest. And then suddenly it was taking down lionfish, which are like that size, and it grabs them, it pulls them to the ground. It's, wax them, and then they just disappear into the sand. Um, don't know how it does that, and then the next day you find all the bones. <laughs> so, you know, that, that was amazing. But, you know, it was intense, like kneeling there, waiting, and this was in the dark with the infrared, because we can't, we can't see the infrared uh, light with, you know, with our are eyes. Are you in a mini-sub, or are you in No, just, we're just, we're just with, diving. So this is with rebreathers. For eight, for eight hours. So yeah. you're kneeling on the floor in complete darkness yeah. next to a flesh-eating monster in the for, <laughs> for eight hours at a time in cold water. Yeah, yeah, shivering a little bit. And do you love um, this job? Yes. Yes. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah and... Um, it was, yeah, no, it's, it's amazing. You do, you do get sort of conscious in the darkness because you can only tell what's happening by looking through the, the not very big viewfinder of the, the camera. Mm. Um, and so you don't want to really put your fingers anywhere just in case there is another one. We do scout the area to try and make sure we're not going to be near one. And where we're kneeling as well is often just empty, barren sort of sand or mud, so we're not you know, damaging anything. But um, yeah, and, you know, your imagination kneeling for eight hours in utter darkness does, you know, it's like, oh, what was that? <laughs> but, um, you know, obviously, it, well, it, worth it, all, worth all it went well. In the end. It is, yes. Yeah. But I did, so I think the coldness um, had put a lot of particulate matter in the water. And I ended up um, towards the end of the shoot with a really severe um, outer, middle, in and inner ear infection and sinus infection. So my, my ear was like literally like dripping green pus. It was very unpleasant, <laughs> but it did mean I couldn't dive. Um, and it also gave me a bit of um, nausea. So I was on the boat throwing up while we were filming the very last bits of the shoot. But we came back with the sequence, which is what Mark wanted. Ab That's the main right. thing. <laughs> right, right. What a, a glamorous life. That's fantastic. Exactly. Thank you. And Mark, what's your clip? You've got well, here. fortunately, as a series producer, you get to choose what shoots you go on. <laughs> <laughs> and um, I wanted to show you the boiling sea because I think it represents the challenge of, of making Blue Planet 2. Uh, the first attempt to film this phenomenon uh, we did off the coast of uh, Northern Australia, and it was the first shoot of the entire series. So this is back in October 14. And the ambition was th to uh, go out um, into the Coral Sea, 20 miles offshore, and find an area where there's this deep sea fish called the landfish, it was one of the most numerous um, cre creatures of the backbone on the planet. But we've ne we hardly ever see it because it lives in the twilight zone, so 500 meters down. But once a year, they're, uh, they're known to aggregate and come up to the surface to spawn around the sea mount. And when they do so, all the predators pile in like tuna and sharks, and it becomes this mayhem feeding event of a scale that turns the whole sea into this boiling mass. And the tuna fishermen know about it because they're after the tuna, and they tell these apocryphal stories of this, you know, football-sized areas of, 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 of ocean just boiling with action. So we thought, well, this, this sounds great. No one's ever filmed this before. 
that'd be easy. Let's just go out, rock up, and we'll, we'll get it. And um, we did. This is our first shoot in the series. It cost a fortune. We went out there for three weeks with huge vessels, submarines, uh, um, and, and ROVs, and we didn't see a single lanternfish. It was big, and then we found out it was the beginning of El Nino, which is this, as Sarah says, this uh, mm. climactic event where sea levels uh, uh, are unseasonally high. In fact, they were two degrees warmer than, than, than normal. And that just switched off the whole breeding cycle of, of lanternfish. Um, and it was our first shoot. And it, it was a bit embarrassing. Explain to me like James and, and, uh, and a few other people. I'm sorry, you know, this, and they're going, hmm, okay. So we like that then. The good news is that 18 months later, El Nino waned, and on the other side of the Pacific Ocean, off the coast of Costa Rica, which hosts a similar event, um, they had their own uh, um, mass gathering of land and fish, which, in, which uh, attracts their own population of, of tuna and spinner dolphins. And we stationed ourselves, I was lucky enough to go on the shoot, direct the aerials, 20 miles offshore on this big vessel, research vessel that had a helicopter launch. And so we were able to use a helicopter to scour this huge area of ocean every day and find the, the spinners, and they were the key to finding the babels, because they, they go dive under, find the lanternfish, and pin them at the surface, and then, then there's, there's all mayhem. So we just thought we'd show you uh, the, 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 the good news, which is we did actually get it in the end. Mm -hmm. Let's see the clip. Yeah. to the surface and forcing the lanternfish to pack more closely together. And now the sea begins to boil. The tuna charge into the shoal at over 40 miles an hour. by the hundred. The shoal has now been largely dispersed, and the sailfish pick off the survivors. In just 15 minutes, all that's left is a silvery confetti of scales. Amazing. <laughs> <laughs> And did you always know there was likely to be another one, but you had to find no, it, or you no, just... Didn't. No, no. So, uh, it's, it's obviously a stressful thing, but if you believe... Well, when we found this other opportunity, again, we rigorously tested whether it was worth pursuing, but um, it was a vindication that we finally did manage to film it and, um, and get it into the, the big blue. There's quite a nice thing as well there, which was, um, you know those rays that come in in the end and they eat the lanternfish? That, that had never been described scientifically before. Uh, they believed that the rays really ate plankton, and so to see them actively hunting fish was the first, and there's now been a paper written on that. So when we collaborate with the scientists, it's kind of a two-way thing, because yes, they can help us with the stories, but equally, um, you know, we are able to kind of show some things that really haven't been described before, which is really mm. thrilling. And when did they 
get to see it? I mean, you're feeding pictures back at all, all the time. Are the scientists seeing them or just the TV well, sometimes, people? Or... Sometimes we have scientists with us and, mm -hmm. and sometimes, you know, we'll, we'll get the rushes and, and bring them in or show them or send them off because, you know, we'd like an interpretation. Um, sorry, Mark, can you go Oh, no, no, it's just, just sort of backing up. Most, we could not make this series without, without working hand in glove with, with the scientists, but sometimes we have to be bold and just follow stories that no one has ever heard of, like, like the, 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 the octopus that armed it itself, um, mm. again, shark attack, or the giant trevally that, that leaps, and that, that came from a friend of a friend who's a fisherman, uh, who knew of a fisherman in South Africa. It wasn't in South Africa at all, it actually was a story originating out of the Seychelles Islands. But it was such an incredible story that we, we actually managed to find, track that person down get to the source and they said yes I'm a fly fisherman and I and, I, and when I fly fish uh, um, I noticed that these giant giant trevally leaping out catching birds in midair and so we thought oh, we just got to go for it so that wasn't described scientifically there wasn't a single photograph to go on but typically we work with scientists and so you went where he said he had seen it yeah yeah and how long did you have to wait before uh, well that, that we, we filmed that over two seasons um, the first season we, we went with an awful lot of expensive equipment, the Cineflex, which is this gyro-stabilized camera that hangs off the side of the boat that means you can film with a long lens that's stabilized so you can go into real detail. Uh, and we got minimal glimpses. Uh, we then subsequently spoke to a, a local uh, um, who said, don't bother that, follow me. <laughs> and... and um, he showed us this this spot where they hunt, and you can film them uh, actually on a, on the tri off the tripod. And we returned the next year with a super slow mo camera. Subsequently, the, a typhoon had hit hit the island. There'd been a, uh, a tick infestation of of the, of the of the tern colony, so we weren't sure what we were going to find. No one lives on this tiny little coral atoll. But thankfully, um, there was a healthy population of birds, and and the Giant Trevally were in rude health and, and we got behavior, but in super slow-mo, filming uh, a thousand frames a second. So you could see the detail of the leaps. And it was always to be a four-year project. You knew when it was to be delivered and, and, and all yeah. of that. So yeah. if, if you don't get it in that time, you've just got to sort of uh, put that on the back. Try of something else. Try, try, yeah. try something else. Yeah. So how important was technology? I mean, we've said it was important, but I mean, lots and lots of different technologies. We've heard about the light, uh, the infrared light yeah. and so on. But I mean, this was crucial to why this series worked. No, that's right. And so some of the technologies off the shelf technologies, like the rebreathers we were talking about earlier, um, uh, and actually some cameras came on the market during filming that, that had increased light sensitivity, which allowed us to do things. Other bits of kit um, we had to build ourselves. So. Um, the, the the cameras that would go on the backs of the large animals, the big sharks and the whales, for example, these suction cup cameras. Uh, scientists had built some, uh, and they're rammed full of um, amazing um, uh, gadgets. There's about 10 different sensors within them, so they're not just picking up the um, video and the audio of what's going on. They're also uh, maybe recording sea temperature, direction of travel, depth, things like that. Um, but no one had actually designed one to go into the deep ocean. And one of our real ambitions was, uh, could we, and I remember discussing this with you, Mark, right at the beginning, could we ever follow a sperm whale into the abyss? You know, could we, could we go on that ride and, and, and see what it's like? You know, that sort of Moby Dick thing. Could we do it, really? And, um, and, and our team, one of our producers, literally set about designing this. And, and rebuilt um, a tiny camera with these suction cups that, that could be attached to um, the back of a sperm whale and for the first time dive with it. I think we've got We've got a clip. I think that's mm. clip uh, six, if, uh, if that's possible to show clip. Uh... Now go on! I spent thousands of hours with these whales and hundreds of hours with this family, but I've never seen the world the way they have. Well, it's a part of the world that we don't get to see very often, whether it's the sperm whale part or not. The ocean is very hard for us to explore, so to see what a whale sees is going to be very exciting. Hello. 
So the tag I think went off on fingers, which is fantastic. Uh, she has a new calf now named Digit. This unit is the group of seven. Uh, we've spent hundreds of hours with them, thousands probably. Uh, they're the most well-studied family of sperm whales in the world. There have been cameras that have gone out on sperm whales before. I haven't seen a lot of the footage or know how successful they are, but this is the first time that a uh, camera tag has gone out on an animal that we know by name, that we know their family history, uh, and the social relationships of the other animals that hopefully we'll get to see on camera. It's amazing every time we do this. We stuck this on the back of a whale. It rode around for about 30 hours seeing everything that she saw. It popped off and signaled us where to go. And we found something the size of a shoe. And now we get to bring it home and see what it saw. Well trained, this is what we've got back from the sea. It's very exciting. A little dog called Fido. But what we don't know is what's inside. <laughs> The tension is palpable. Is it dry? I think so, yeah. That's good. That means the tube held. Okay, back, 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 back. No, no, no. This is going to be the most exciting part. Holy <laughs> shit. Okay, all right. <laughs> She's right above, she's right above. Well, I mean, we've never had this perspective of what life as a sperm whale is before, ever. If, if the producer was here, John, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> he would do a whole repertoire of, of clicking sounds, and it's very amusing, actually. But why they're so uh, euphoric is that that was uh, eight months of planning and, and R&D. Uh, with this box of frogs, and, and eventually, <laughs> finally, they, they, they got just reward. John so. was literally finishing making that, um, that camera tag at breakfast with his screwdrivers before they went out on the boat, and it had just been finished. That's amazing. Yeah. 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 I'm going to come to the audience shortly, but I would like to show that clip 500 hours. Tell us a bit about what that... Yeah, yeah. so, uh, you know, our team, our, we have this amazingly <coughs> dedicated team of... Um, men and women photographers who, who go out around the world and film. Um, but there's probably no more challenging <laughs> environment that calls for more patience than when you're um, stuck in an acrylic bubble that's two metres across, three people for 10 hours at a time, weeks on end. Um, and, and that's the challenge, I think, that the dive team faced. And we wanted to share with you the, uh, their experience in their words of, of uh, what it's like to go on a sub-expedition. And as you can see, it does drive them quite potty. Let's see the clip, 500 hours. <laughs> <laughs> this is Orla Doherty, possibly the most patient producer director I've ever worked with. And together, we spent almost 500 hours in this tiny bubble behind us. La, 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 la. This is Gavin Thurston top wildlife cameraman. I've had the privilege of working with him for weeks on end, giving him chocolate to keep him happy. The worst thing about it is when we're in front of something absolutely incredible, knowing that we're only going to be with it for about 10 minutes and missing the moment because the sub moves or the current drifts us or whatever it is, and we knowing that we'll never ever see that animal, that landscape again. This wasn't meant to be our day. I don't, I don't think this dive has really worked. The problems have been endless. Uh, camera's not working, light's not working. Finding you get down to 900 meters, like sort of record-breaking depths beneath the ocean, three of you in that tiny sub to find out you've only got two sandwich boxes. <laughs> <laughs> 
thing here, well, they're always concerned about seals. Not That's not Arctic seal or Antarctic seals. We're talking about the O-rings that actually stop water coming into the submarine. And Ralph said, Orla, you just keep an eye on that hatch and make sure it's not leaking. And I honestly thought he was joking, but he wasn't. The highlight for me has been seeing animals that we believe are surface animals that live in the top layer of the ocean and encountering them at phenomenal depths, like swordfish coming straight at us at 700 meters, and yes, there was screaming. Just getting a whole new insight into how deep these animals work, that how their world is so much bigger than we ever imagined. That's been incredible. Occasionally, all are swapped out and let the scientists come into the deep. And I would say to the scientists, you see that thing there? We've been seeing a lot of those. What's that? And the scientist goes, I have no bloody idea. And it's fantastic to think there are things 800 metres beneath our feet now are things that nobody's seen before that we don't even know what they are. Right, can we have the lights up on the audience? And um, I've got lots of questions, so if you have none at all, I'm happy to go on. But if you have questions, if you could put your hand up, somebody will bring a microphone. Um, who would like to ask a question? As I say, oh, yes, we've got one there. If, um, if you could say uh, who you are and where you're from, if that's relevant. Hey, my name is Duncan Payne, and I sell money to people who buy all the technical equipment. I'm interested in, in what drove the choices on the camera um, presume it's all shot in 4K or UHD, yeah. and, and what drove their decisions and, and what cameras did you use? The, the, our, work, our main workhorse was the, uh, the Red Dragon, which is a, a 4K camera, and uh, it filmed the, the, the bulk of, of Blue Planet 2. But it's, it's being recorded, so if you speak in the microphone. Okay, yeah. is that because all the um, the gates housings are already made for the Red Dragon, aren't they? No, not necessarily. Uh, uh, we didn't use gates houses exclusively either. A lo lot of camera people have their own specially designed camera housing. Uh, we've, we've, we like the aesthetics of, of, of the Red Camera. We like how they handle uh, underwater contrast, how they handle low light. Um, and... Um, but equally, they're, they're, they're a fantastic workhorse topside as well. So I, th I think it was the complementary, uh, uh, um, how they react to, to colour temperatures underwater and, and perform above water with their contrast range and low light uh, uh, capabilities. That's what really drew us to, to them. But we didn't use that, that camera exclusively. Um, for super low light cameras, we were using A7S uh, along with the Canon ME20s. Um, the sucker cams is a whole other technology. Uh, we're using drones, which have got their own lenses uh, and, and, and camera bodies. So it was a vast uh, array of, of, of different camera systems, but, but, but RED was, was the main one. Phantom Flex. The Phantom Flex, yes, which is our... Uh, yeah. Yes, exactly. Yeah. GoPros. <laughs> you know, it's a, it's a range. It's, it's, you know, yeah. Across the series, we would have used... Do, you know, dozens. Obviously. Yeah. And do you specify the cameras, or you've got lots of expert camera people who've got their own cameras, and um, you talk about it with them, or? Well, we wanted we wanted a uniform look as much as we could across the series. Um, so, uh, and a lot of underwater camera people have invested in in red systems, but um, it wasn't it was it, it it didn't preclude other people with different camera systems from from joining the team because of that. Thank you. Yes, Any, another question. Yes, we've got one here, if you bring a microphone um, here. And again, if you can just say uh, who you are, where you're from. People think of war correspondents as being incredibly brave because they're reporting on war. Are you, like, as crazy and nuts as those people? Because <laughs> you're just like... Um, it's quite brave what you're doing. When that submarine was under attack, and I know... So I was just wondering how you deal with all of the fear and... It's almost like the war correspondents are reporting on, but and also, do you ever feel sorry for the animals that are dying and who killed the rob who eats the robbit? Bobbit. <laughs> I'll, I'll, answer, I'll answer the first question. Uh, I'll give you an, an analogy. When we go filming aerials, we always make sure we choose a pilot who's over 40 years old. The good ones are still alive, and and and, <laughs> and we work with only the, the best underwater teams, the people who've been at it a long time and really know what they're doing. And 
it's, it's, it's the profess professionalism of, of the crews you work with that enables you to do what, what looks like danger, dangerous, uh, uh, um, risky, risky uh, um, environments, but actually health and safety is, is fundamental to everything we do, and, and we have so much risk analysis and so, so much vetting that actually when you, when you enter in, although we are underwater pioneers, we're going to new worlds and we're filming in places no one's ever dived, like, like going to the, the bottom of Antarctica or, or what, what Sarah gets up to. Um, I mean, they don't tell me everything, what happens on location, but overall, um, it, the, but like this, uh, you know, we came back, uh, everyone with their limbs and, and a few bleeding ears, but, but um, overall, um, you know, every, everyone's health and well. Well, Sarah, Sarah. So the injury Sarah mentioned was the worst on the whole series, you know, and it's a really boring answer, but the truth is we take the risk out of it, you know, and we have to because, because you know, <laughs> for obvious reasons. It's, a, it's such a hostile environment in which to work. You can't, you can't take risks. You can't take it lightly. But you have to be brave, I mean, to do that, don't you? I don't know if it's being brave. We are all coming with a lot of experience, and we, can't, and we take to the shoots after a lot of research, so we know what to expect. I have you know, some 50-page risk assessments where we think about everything that could happen and how we, we can mitigate, how we can limit the chances of that happening or what we would do with you know, evacuation plans and things like that. So we, we go into it, I guess, having thought about it so much before we get on location. Um, and then you're in work mode, you have a job to do. I mean, it's an amazing job, but it is still us going there to deliver a product based on our experience and our research and to observe the animals. So yeah, we, you know, we, we go there and it doesn't, it just, it's, it's our job. But is there this very powerful drive that you all have? You really want to get down there and see it and do the program, as he, he mentioned, a war correspondent. Is there any parallel at all, do you think? Well, there's a passion. There's a huge yeah. passion for it. Our team, are, yeah. what, you know, what unites the team is a passion for the oceans. We all kind of, in different ways, have come to the conclusion that the oceans and the health of the world's oceans are, like, really important. Uh, and so there's a kind of driving passion and dedication that you see. And so people put in the hours. They, they put up with the hardships to do it. Um, you know, if you're ice diving, it's uncomfortable, but you'll do it. Because if you want to share that world with people, you know, and, and, and it's the same with the sub team, it's with, same with all the teams, really. So it's, I think that's the unifying thing more than anything. I'd say it's a passionate team, actually, mm -hmm. and that's, that's great. Yes, so we've got one there. If you just keep your hand up, that's great. Yep. I was just wondering if there are any of the myths and legends that you actually w went after but missed. <coughs> well, goose chases that. Uh... Well, we're, yeah. People ask us. <coughs> How, how often did you fail? And, and actually, because the stakes are so high uh, and budget's tight, we, we, we have to iron out as much risk as possible. So, so actually, our hit rate is pretty good. We, we don't always get it first go. We may have to go back again. Some of the sequences, like the bait ball in Norway, was taken over three years, uh, over three subsequent winters. So um, it's, it's, it's a constant process of refinement and embellishment until you, you've got what, what, what you think is going to be a cracking sequence. I think of 125 <coughs> expeditions, we only had three that you know, failed completely. Um, but if you're also asking about kind of what else is out there, <coughs> the white whale. There are white whales out there. <coughs> um, I talked to an IROV pilot once who said that he was off the coast of Brazil and his sub was suddenly dragged half a mile off course by something with huge suckers on it. And, it, and no one knows what that was. So there probably are still, you know, it makes sense. You know, we've, we've seen such a tiny percentage of the ocean. There must <coughs> still be things down there. And Loch Ness? Um... <laughs> That's fresh water. Yeah. Right. Yes, we've got one here. My name's Jess. When you discover fish down there and you don't know what they are, how do you, you when you get the footage of them, when do you like you try to discover what they are, do you then broadcast what you find or do you just explore them and then broadcast them after? Go on, Sarah. Um, to help with uh, fish identification or cetacean identification, mm -hmm. if it's something 
that our team, like Mark said, a lot of like our researchers were marine biologists before moving to TV, so a lot of them were very good at identifying what we were filming. Um, but if it is something we don't know, we take it to scientists who specialize in fish or cetaceans in that habitat. Um, and if they don't know, they'll ask their colleagues, and normally we will find out. I think the deep, though, was the, the hardest with identification, just because sometimes it was brand new life, which then was very exciting for the scientists. But you know, we, we had such support from the scientific community, helping us um, identify things, helping us give facts, checking our facts that we had in our script. You know, it wasn't just um, working uh, with them on location. They supported us throughout the entire process. So. They, they normally were able to identify things for us. But there are totally new things that you discovered that people either didn't have a name for or... Um... So that behaviour that Mark talked about, the <coughs> octopus creating a sort of shoot, suit, suit of shells <coughs> as body armour, that was never described by science force. So literally, you're adding to the sum of world knowledge by right. filming that, because no one's known it before. And nobody had suggested, oh, go and you'll find an octopus doing that. Well, that, that was or... a, one naturalist <coughs> who goes for a swim in the kelp every morning. He said you should check it out. And by the way, he's probably quite brave, because it's, the, it's, the, it's got 100 different species of shark in those waters. But um, he's, he's very, the thing with all these animals is we're not on their menu. You know, and he goes swimming there every day, has done for six years. And in doing so, he, he, he kept seeing the same octopus and sort of seeing these behaviors. Yeah. Yes, we've got a question in the front row here. <coughs> Thank you. I'm, I'm, I'm a drama director. I'm simply in awe of what you do with this. It makes what I do seem like a doddle in comparison. <laughs> um, uh, the final programme was a very, like, very, very powerful ecological message, oh, maybe unusually so for the tone of these programmes. Was that the plan from the beginning, or was this cumulatively with what you saw? No, we, we always set out, didn't we, with the idea that um, we wanted to tell a contemporary portrait of the world's oceans. If we kind of made a timeless classic of these amazing animals all happily going around <coughs> their lives, that wouldn't have been true to the oceans as we know it. So um, we always wanted to kind of give that real, <coughs> real sort of real world check in. Because, um, as we said in the opening, you know, the state of the world's oceans is something that's critically important to all of us. And, and actually, makes the oceans really relevant to every one of us. Every time we breathe in, we're breathing in um, oxygen, and half the oxygen on the planet is made by things in the sea. So, um, you know, it is directly relevant to us. And, and, and these big issues we needed to address. And yeah, absolutely. Uh, but at the same time, we have to make it compelling, entertaining, and make sure that people didn't drop away the end of the six blue chips and, and, and not come to it. In fact, we can be very proud of the fact that the audience level sustained across the whole seven. In other words, people were equally compelled by this environmental episode <coughs> as one of the blue chips. And, and so we, what we wanted to do was um, relate it to, to, to the content within, within the prior episodes. Therefore, we revisited characters like Percy the Tuck's fish and showed that his coral reef world had disintegrated with, with, with two massive bleaching events over two consecutive years. And, and meet the scientist who, who cried down his mask because he <coughs> fell in love with, with Percy and, and it was a tragedy unfolding in front of his eyes. And by telling it in a sort of personalised way, we hoped that the audience would, would, would empathise, connect and, and care equally and, and um, it become a gripping film. It was, was what you it, found when you were actually out filming what you expected or worse? Uh, I, I mean, none of us are naive. We've been in this business a long time. We know there's awful <laughs> problems and, and issues that the oceans face. So I don't think it was anything that was massively unexpected, but doesn't make it less uh, uh, tragic. I, I, I think the plastic side of it was, you know, I think, it, I think during, I think my understanding of plastics in the marine environment has changed completely in the last four years. Not that we haven't seen a lot of it on our beaches. There's been plastic on our beaches a lot, you know. Um, and you see it all around the world. And weirdly, you often find the biggest deposits of plastic in the most remote places. And that's largely because of the way the oceans kind of suck in debris into their middles. Um, you get these gyres of plastic and that, you know, the, the islands of plastic in the Pacific and things. So um, the garbage patches, you know, it, it's... Um, the, I think the scale of that we're only still learning about and only still discovering now. There was something in the news last week saying that it's bigger than we had previously thought. 
um, but the extent, the insidious <coughs> nature of um, the spread of plastic, we saw it down in the deep <coughs> ocean, um, we saw it in the middle of oceans, we saw animals sheltering under it. You know, we had that incident with the baby sperm whale that, that had a plastic bucket in its mouth and the divers knew this baby sperm whale because they hung out together occasionally and he swam over, he filmed it and they thought, oh God, what's that? Oh, it's a bucket. And he thought, I better take it off the, the, the whale. So the whale came up to him, showed him the bucket. He took the bucket off. The whale thought that was a great game and snatched it back. <laughs> So he took it off the whale again, and um, the baby whale yeah. thought, well, that's not fair, and grabbed hold of his fin and took him down on a dive. And he was only snorkeling, so he was holding his breath for a while, so they both came back up, and he was able to throw the bucket into the boat. And, um, and it was only then that the whale kind of gave <clears> up. And that's what it took to get one bit of plastic out of the ocean. But it had a huge impact, this, this programme. I presume you didn't expect the impact that it's had since then, and so many people are now collecting plastic, banning plastic. Um, it's something for the politicians to actually tackle that they can sort of do something uh, about. When did it become clear to you you'd really actually struck home to people with that? Uh, you, you, you never know how the audience are going to react to, to, to the series. Uh, you, you know, it's fingers crossed and, and obviously the marketing of it is important and... Your wish, of course, is, is that everyone's going to get going to come to the series. Um, but we we didn't have any idea that people would be that impassioned. I mean, there have always been a lot of organisations, environmental groups who who are doing great work to, to to campaign on these issues. So it wasn't new what we were saying. It's just that we provided a platform uh, that that really got 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 the broader message out. And uh, was there any moment when you thought, no, this really has hit home and um, we've, we're actually, as well as providing a fantastic series, something is going to live on as a result of this? And well, so on? We, you did a lot of beach cleans, <coughs> but we, we started seeing those sort of increase in frequency, didn't mm. we? Yeah. 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 And, um, and so we started to see this building passionate response and then politicians sp started speaking about it. And... Um, and uh, Yes, as Mark says, there were a lot of individuals and NGOs and campaigners who had been talking about <clears> plastics, <throat> but TV does that thing of turning a hard spotlight on a subject and catalyzing that conversation. And that, you know, <clears> there's <throat> not a week that's gone by since where there hasn't been headlines <clears throat> about it. So it's just <clears throat> grown and grown. And as documentary makers, as you might imagine, it's just the most rewarding thing to, to, to feel that something you've played a part in highlighting is, is now such a big conversation. And um, it feels... You know, everywhere we look, people are talking about it. But they're also, you know, w there was a beach clean the other day in Cornwall, and there were six thousand items picked up off it, half of which <coughs> were earbuds. Yeah. And it just makes you wonder how on earth are all those earbuds getting into the sea, and why? And and I, hopefully, you know, <coughs> we're now challenging together as a country, as a global community, even you know, quite what we're doing about single-use plastics and, and where they're going. And for us, the issue is always, it hasn't been plastic itself. It's been, you know, it, what happens to it in the marine environment. Yeah. Well, I can exclusively reveal that the RTS magazine will no longer be delivered to you in a plastic cover. Um, so um, that is one... Um, <laughs> so... Uh, congratulations uh, on that. We've got a question. We've got a question there. Hi, my name is Claire Burns. I'm a freelance production manager eking out a BBC4 arts budget at the moment. Mm. And uh, when you said you had a tight budget, uh, yeah. obviously you've got, you had a lot of co-production partners. Uh, I wondered if you stayed within budget. No. <laughs> <laughs> no way. Well, it's, it's commercially sensitive, so we, we can't. I mean, it was in, no, it was in the many millions. Mm. I think it was the most expensive wildlife series, perhaps. In its day. So can you, you say it's not cheap? Just it's one of the oceans just, isn't cheap. Right. Yeah. Can you say where the budget came from? Who who actually contributes to that budget, and how does that work? So, so public service commission the, mm -hmm. the series, <coughs> and then uh, we take it to market, and we take it to market at um, through worldwide, BBC Worldwide, at events like um, Showcase, for example, and that's where we start bringing co-producers on board, and we had. Um, five or six co-producers um, for different territories that joined us right at the beginning, and then uh, Worldwide will um, underwrite the rest um, to make it possible. I mean, it, clearly, they are um, 
you know, they're expensive things to do. You know, 125 expeditions is a lot, isn't it? Um, and it's four years for a team. But it's the only way these things can get made. And what's wonderful about it is that through Worldwide, we have got this amazing distribution. We'd expect 200 territories around the world to, to watch, to, to, to show the series. Uh, the series was simulcast um, in China as it went out on the BBC. <coughs> And um, I know on Tencent, on their viewing platform, they had 225 views of, of the Blue Planet um, really? album, mm -hmm. which, is, which is amazing. Um, so uh, we're also reaching new markets, and it does feel genuinely like a, a global thing. So that's the, kind of the scale of it. And I think Ther Theresa May um, had a DVD set that she gave to the uh, Chinese leader on her visit uh, yeah. over there. Yeah. Um, so, uh, mm -hmm. Everyone is talking about the BBC in comparison with Netflix and Amazon and everybody. Can the BBC compete in this new world for these very big blockbuster series, do you think? Or how difficult is it for them? Well, I think we are. Um, well, we are now, but everybody's looking ahead and saying, uh, can that be sustained? Um, from everything I've heard, you know, it's, I, it's something that... Um, you know, natural history and landmark natural history is something that you know the BBC is very proud of and is seen as a a leader in, and that we intend to stay that way. Got a question there. Hi, I'm Lisa. Um, firstly, my deep gratitude for sharing your passion on the subject matter with all of us. It's an incredible eye-opening series that I'm sure many of us will remember for a lifetime. So thank you for that, firstly. Secondly, there must be so many learnings that you've had over the course of, of the 20 odd years of, of, of putting this together. What, what are some of those key learnings that you'll take for the 2030 plus edition of, uh, of Blue Planet? Mm -hmm. Blue Planet 3 is gonna be about the incredible cover of the world's oceans, um, <laughs> we hope. Um, what are the learnings? Um, the world feels like it's getting a smaller place. Um, I, I, and every glimpse we have of something new feels very, very precious. And the footprint of humanity feels very um, evident everywhere we go now. Um, that's how it's changing over a period of time, in my mind. Mm. I, th I think um, what we set out to do was to demonstrate how sophisticated and complex life is in, in the ocean. And there's a fish that can use a tool to crack open its, its clam. And tool use is something that we typically associate with chimpanzees and, and other intelligent uh, um, primates. So we're going to find more and more and more intelligent behaviors underwater. Uh, and when you start thinking of these creatures uh, um, as sophisticated uh, um, beings, it, it changes your relationship with them. So. Are we going to be so keen to eat an octopus next time, knowing how, how clever they are? And um, I think more and more as science delves into it and, and reveals these secrets, um, we're going to be more in awe of, of, of how complex re life really is and how important it is to us that it remains healthy. Sarah? Would you like to add to that? Mm. Have you got a, le a lesson? I think it's really, yeah, what Mark and James have said, but I think sort of James and Mark have not just with the final episode being able to show the human impact on the oceans, but uh, throughout the main episodes, which is the first time I think it's really been incorporated, things like the coral bleaching or um, the pilot well and its dead calf sequence, where we've really shown human impact through natural history. And you know, that, that was, that f from my perspective as a, as a viewer, that felt very new on these big um, landmark series. And I think that's because we now really can't ignore our impact on our planet. And I think it's fantastic as TV is able to develop um, its, its style to, to, to show what really is happening on, in, in nature now. So, yeah, that's what I, I'm... I think we've got time for one more clip. Do you have a preference? Is it the tusk fish or is it the rays? Um... I think we should show Percy the tusk fish because he's such yeah. a character. OK, can we see the last uh, clip, number seven, please? I've been diving on the reef out here for 21 years now, actually, since I was eight years old, so a fair while, and then snorkeling for quite a while before that. 
I've always absolutely loved fish. When I was little, they were just something amazingly pretty to look at, but I didn't really understand that much about them, about their behavior or anything like that. But now through studying them, um, I found out that there's way more going on in their, in their heads than we ever thought. And they're really complex animals and there's actually um, a fair bit of intelligence in there. Fish have definitely got personalities, like you'll get individuals that are just polar opposites from each other and this is within the same species. So you know, out on the reef you'll get one that's really curious, one that's really shy of you, so it's quite nice, you can definitely get to know individuals. The first time I saw the tusk fish cracking a clam open on its little anvil, I was just gobsmacked. Like, I've been looking at this reef for well over 20 years, um, and I'd never seen it before. Seeing it carrying around what to us would be like a golf ball sized clam in its mouth, it's just absolutely ridiculous. It's amazing. And so the tusk fish have got these, you know, big snaggly teeth poking out the front there, which are you know, not that attractive, but they're perfect for picking up little clams. So, you know, he picks up the little clam, takes it back to his little castle where there's one little spot where he whacks it on, then he just and, you know, whacks it back and forth a few times, sometimes it flies out, and then eventually, after 20 or so cracks, he'll, he'll get it open and Bob's your uncle. Fantastic. I don't think we can end on a better note than that. A huge round of applause, please. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. Thank you.